Let's welcome Dr. Leslie Manpo. Okay, uh, I don't have much time, so I will start with about the simplest system I know of, a clock, simplest digital system. And as a matter of fact, I don't even have time for some real clock. I'll talking about a one-bit clock. So this is what a one-bit clock looks like to an engineer. Uh, it's a physical system. It uh, represented as voltage as a function of time. If you've studied anything in physics or anything about uh, science, you'll see graphs like that. Uh, its behavior is described by voltage as a function of time. Now, what this makes this a digital system is that we can take an idealized view of the clock's behavior and we can pretend that it's not really this little fuzzy, uh, complicated graph of uh, voltage versus time. We can pretend that there are just two values, zero and one, and it switches from one to the other instantaneously. And that's what makes it a digital system. Now, so we abstract away continuous voltage. I'm also going to abstract away time because I don't have the time to get into details about you know, how you worry about whether it's ticking at the right speed or not. I'm just going to worry about the fact that it's ticking, going from 0 to 1 and 1 to 0 and back again. And so uh, we don't care exactly when it ticks. So we can describe this system as a sequence, as a behavior, as a sequence of states where a state is just an assignment of values to variables. In this case, we just have a single variable, which I'm calling v. And now, there's a practical method of uh, specifying sequences of states. Uh, you do it by specifying an initial state, what the first state is, and a state transition, how you go from one state to the other. So they can be described in lots of ways. For example, programming notation. Here you say the initial state, you sign v to 0, and then the state transition can be represented by this little piece of program. Or you can describe it by an automaton, which will look something like this. You have a little circle for every state, and arrows telling you how to go between them, and some funny... Uh, picture saying that uh, this is an initial state. And there are all sorts of weird computer science languages that people have invented. But uh, I was trained as a mathematician and a scientist, so I'm going to do it in what I think is a better way, math. So to specify initial state, what you're specifying is just a set of states. And a state transition is simply a relation between uh, states. Now, sets and relations, that's the lifeblood of mathematics. So how do we represent the set of states? Well, I'll represent it by a predicate, a formula that tell, describes what the set of states are. So a state in an assignment of values to variables so a predicate on states is just a formula containing those variables. So for example, here's the formula describing the initial state. Very simple. Now a relation between states, you can also describe as a predicate, this time not on states, but on pairs of states. So the way I'll do it, lots of different ways you can do it, but pretty much one basic way, you have a formula that talks at both about the old state and the new state. And I'll do it using primed and unprimed variables, where the unprimed variables describe, are, 
uh, the values of the variables in the first state, and the prime variables are discussing the values in the second state. So here is an example. The value of v in the new state, v prime, is equal to the value of its old, in the old state, plus 1, modulo 2. So here it is described in math. So I've described, admittedly, a simple system, but no languages, no programming languages, no pictures, none of that stuff, just two simple formulas. What could possibly be more elegant than that? Well, specifying it with one formula. And to do that, I'll have to introduce a little bit of temporal logic. Uh, a temporal logic formula is a predicate not on states or on pairs of states, but on behaviors. And remember that a behavior is just a sequence of states, and a state is just an assignment of values to variables. This is all very simple. So a formula like v prime equals v plus 1 mod 2, Remember, that's a formula that's a predicate on pairs of states. So that formula, viewed as a temporal formula, is true on a behavior if and only if it's true on the first two states. And as a special case, v equals 0 doesn't have any prime variables, so it's just a, a predicate on the first state. So it's true on a behavior if and only if v equals tr zero is true on the first state. And then I'll introduce a single temporal formula, a uh, temporal operator, the box operator. Uh, and box f is true on a behavior if and only if f is true on all suffixes of the behavior, including the behavior itself. The behavior is considered as a suffix of itself. So, for example, what does box v equals zero mean? Well, box v equals zero is true on a behavior beta if and only if v equals zero is true on every suffix of, a of the behavior. But what does it v equals zero mean, being true on a behavior mean? Well, it means it's true on a behavior if and only if it's true in the first state of the behavior. So that's true if and only if v equals zero is true on the first state of every suffix of the behavior. Well, every state of a behavior is the first state of some suffix the behavior, the suffix that starts in that state. So that's true if and only if v equals zero is true on every state of the behavior. So this is all quite simple. So instead of what I'll do is take those two formulas and using this box operator, I'll turn them into a single formula. So what does this mean? This formula is true on a behavior, the v equals a conjunction of two formulas. It's true if and only if both formulas are true. So the first formula, v equals zero, asserts that v equals zero in the first state of the behavior. And the next part, the box, asserts that v prime equals v plus one mod two is true for all successive pairs of states in the behavior. So that describes exactly what I was saying in words before, with just one formula. OK, now we're ready to get onto something a lot more complicated, twice as complicated. Well, a two-bit clock. OK, we start with a one-bit clock. It's uh, described with voltage V and T. And we add a low-order bit. So it looks something like this. But again, this is a digital system, so we can abstract from the actual physical behavior an idealized view where you have discrete states. 
So these two variables, V for the high order bit and W for the low order bit, all both take the value only zero or one. And so here is the system behavior. Starts with V and W both zero, then the low order bit changes, then it changes to zero and the high order bit changes, and so on. Does this thing have a laser? Oh well, <laughs> I'll have to point uh, verbally. So, but if I give you a, a two-bit clock and I say, forget about the first low order bit, well, you've got a one-bit clock. I mean, if I tell you to you know, hide the second hand on your clock, you have an hour and minute clock. So, here's the behavior of the two-bit clock. And if I ignore W, well, I now have a one-bit clock, so this should be a behavior of the one-bit clock. But something looks wrong here. Notice that we have two states with V equals zero, then two states with V equals one, and so on. So, how can that be? I mean, those steps aren't allowed because those steps say that every step has to satisfy V prime equals V plus one mod two. So we've got a problem. And the solution to the problem is we let the formula allow stuttering steps, steps that don't change V. Because after all, if the state is describing the system, and the state doesn't change, well, nothing has happened. So, you can't tell if, this, if somebody has, you know, just shows you this one bit of the clock, you don't know that anything is happening, that there's any, you know, low order bit that's changing. So, the way I do that is I just change this specification by allowing this other possibility that Every step either is satisfies V prime equals V plus one mod two, or it satisfies V prime equals V. And I'm just going to introduce a little piece of notation, since I'll do that often, this little square bracket with a subscript, that means or that subscript is unchanged. So there's one problem. This specification allows a behavior that maybe takes a couple of steps and then does nothing but stuttering. What well, that represents, that's a clock that stopped. You know, the, the high order, the, the, the V hand of the clock doesn't move, it's just stopped. And, well, that's certainly a thing that can happen to a clock. Uh, but maybe we don't want the clock to stop. And if we don't want the clock to stop, well, we add a formula that forbids stuttering forever. Now, what I'm doing is writing these, describing this clock with two formulas. This first one, which describes what's called safety. It describes the finite behavior of the clock. And I add another formula that describes liveness, which describes the infinite suffixes of the behavior. In other words, another way of looking at it is the safety part says what's allowed to happen, and the liveness part says what must happen. And for the one-bit clock, I could actually write the formula this way, and if you remember that formula, you write down and think about what that box means and scratch your head for a while, you'll really say, see that it says that it takes infinitely many steps that change V, which says that it can study forever. Well, I could tell you, it would take me about 15 minutes to explain how to write these liveness properties in general, uh, but I'm not going to take the time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ignore liveness. Uh, 
Safety will, is what comes first. You worry generally about safety first. First, you make sure that your system doesn't do anything wrong, doesn't produce the wrong answer. Then you worry about, you know, is it actually going to produce some answer? Um, for later use, I'll give a name to this formula. I'll call it clock. And now I'll describe another system, a little more interesting one. As a matter of fact, it's a very important system. It's a little hardware signaling programming called the two-phase handshake that you know, is probably sitting in, you know, in several places inside of your computer. And in it, processes communicate using two one-bit wires, which I'll call P and C. And there are two processes that I'll call tick and talk. And the initial predicate says that P and C are both equal to 0. Call that I. And the next state relation is the disjunction of two formulas, because there are two possible types of steps that the system can take, a tick step or a talk step. A tick step can be executed when P equals C. And what it does is it complements P, changes it from 1 to 0 or back again, just like a one-bit clock. And it leaves C unchanged. C prime, the new value of C, equals the old value. And talk is, is similar, except a talk step can happen when P equals C, unprimed variables mean the initial state. So a talk step is one in which P is different from C in the first state. C is incremented by 1 mod 2. And P remains unchanged. Now, call that N. And so the handshake uh, protocol is described by this formula, initial predicate, box, next state predicate. And that sub PC, remember, sub PC means N or PC prime equals PC. Well, priming an expression just means priming all the variables in the expression. So that's the same as saying P prime C prime equals PC. And two pairs are equal if and only each if their components are equal. So that's equivalent to saying P prime equals P and C prime equals C. Or in other words, that it's a stuttering step. So what this says is every step is an end step or it leaves P and C unchanged. So there's the two-phase handshake. And if you work it out, you can see there's only one behavior with no stuttering steps. And it looks something like this. Um, OK, now I'm going to we have mathematical formulas. One of the wonderful things about this, you can do all sorts of wonderful things. You can compute with it, uh, lots of stuff. And what I'm going to do is I'll define this expression. I call it V bar. And call it P plus C mod 2. And that, I'll define it to equal that. And then let's see V bar is a function of the, of the variables. So it has a value in every state. So let's look at the values of V bar in all the states of this behavior. Well, 0 plus 0 mod 2 is 0. 1 plus 0 mod 2 is 1. 1 plus 1 mod 2 is 2 mod 2, which is 0. And you can guess what's happening. And in fact, the two-phase handshake changes V bar exactly the same way that the one-bit clock changes V. Well, we can prove this. Wonderful thing about mathematics is you can, you can prove it. But first, we have to state it mathematically. Exactly what does that mean? Well, let me define clock bar 
to be clock, that formula specifying the clock, except with V bar substituting for, substituted for B. It's a nice thing about mathematical formulas, a very important uh, operation of mathematics is substitution. Uh, you can't do that in programming languages or in automata or stuff like that, but it's mathematics. So this is clock bar with, you know, clock with V bar substituted for V, and we can substitute the definition of V bar for V, and it, you know, it means this. So the saying that the two phase, that V bar changes the way the one bit clock changes V, uh, that's true of a behavior if and only if the behavior satisfies this formula, clock bar. So, the statement that the two-phase handshake changes V bar the way the one-bit clock changes V means that every be behavior satisfying the formula HSK satisfies the formula clock bar. Or another way of saying that in mathematics, formula HSK implies clock bar. So this statement in English has this very simple, precise mathematical meaning. And I could t take 10 minutes and write a perfectly rigorous proof of, of this theorem. Now, simple, rigorous proofs aren't the goal. You know, engineers, most of you, you know, when you go out, you know, work, building systems, you're not going to be writing proofs. Rigorous proofs, simple proofs aren't the goal, but they're a sign that you're doing something right. If, pro if verifying something as trivial as this, that the handshake protocol implies this clock protocol, you know, should be pretty simple. And if it's not, you're in trouble. So, what this formula means is that the two-phase handshake implements the one-bit clock under this substitution. Another way of saying it is you implementation or, or refinement, or it refines that uh, statement. Substitution is the basic mathematical concept that underlies implementation. When you say that something implements something else, if it really does, underneath it, there's a theorem, very much like this theorem, H at heist, the handshake implies clock bar. There's no notion of pro substitution in programming languages. Try substituting for x, you know, in, in an assignment statement, x gets something. It just doesn't make any sense. You can't substitute it in an automaton or in most of these weird computer science languages. But there is a language that lets you do this. It's called TLA+. Plus for uninteresting reasons. And this is how I'd write the, uh, um, this specification of the handshake in TLA+, pretty much writing exactly what I wrote uh, before. Uh, well, not exactly because mod is written, you know, percent in TLA+, and you can't write P equals C equals zero. That's an abbreviation for two formulas, P equals zero and C equals zero. But uh, that's what you write this way. And you declare variables, that P and C are variables. Uh, um, this imports the integers module. The operations like plus and percent aren't built into the language. They're defined in a standard module that you know, gets instantiated, gets imported into almost every specification. And then a little bit of uh, boilerplate. And that's the TLA plus specification of this 
to Hefei's uh, handshake protocol. Uh, well, actually, this is the pretty printed version. This is what you actually type. You can see it's uh, not too much different. Uh, that's all there is to it. Uh, for example, where are the type declarations? There are no type declarations. Uh, have you ever seen type declarations in any math class? <laughs> uh, types aren't a concept of ordinary, you know, simple mathematics. Uh, type correctness is actually an easily proved theorem. Type correctness means that P and C are always take the values 0 or 1. And that's this theorem, the theorem that the handshake protocol implies that it's always the case that P is an element of the set 0, 1, and C is an element of the set 0, 1. And that's a trivial pro theorem to prove, or theorem, the trivial theorem for our tools to check. So, I obviously only have time to show you a, a toy example, but TLA plus is a real language. It's not a toy. It has industrial strength tools, has a model checker, which model checking exhaustively checks a small instance of a system. Uh, and if you've never tried it, it does sound, doesn't sound very interesting. I've got this thousand processor system and I can model check it for three processors, but it's incredibly effective at finding bugs because on that three processor system, it checks all possible behaviors. Uh, and it has a proof checker. Uh, proving correctness of real systems is almost always going to be too expensive to be uh, something you, one would do in practice. Uh, and at this very moment, uh, orbiting this comet whose uh, name I can't pronounce uh, is the European Space Agency's Rosetta spacecraft. Uh, this is a simulation showing the lander, which actually is now sitting on the surface of the comet. Uh, their virtuoso real-time operating system, which controls several of the instruments on Rosetta, and that was designed using TLA+. And here's what the leader of the virtuoso development uh, team said. By the way, I knew nothing about it. This was obviously going on for 10 years or something, but I just heard about it a few months ago. Uh, and I wrote to uh, Eric Verhaust, uh, you know, asking him about you know, what his experience was. And here's what he wrote. He said that the TLA plus abstraction helped in coming to a much cleaner architecture. And I love this, he said, we witnessed firsthand the brainwashing done by years of C programming. Uh, one of the results was that the code size was about a tenth the size of a previous version of the system, thanks in very large part to their being designing and thinking about it in terms of TLA+. Plus. Uh, TLA plus use at Amazon, it's being used regularly in system design in Amazon Web Services. Uh, as of a year or so ago, it had been used on 14 real systems, systems that are part of Amazon Web Services being used daily. Uh, there's an article in April's Communications of the ACM that's a very good article that describes their experience in using TLA plus and other things that they've tried. Uh, use, uh, TLA plus was used at Intel uh, by, at one point by four design groups. Uh, the, my informant at Intel has left Intel, so I have no information about what they're doing now. Uh, use at Microsoft. Here's what Dave Langworthy, uh, Microsoft engineer, had to say. He said, using simple math that I learned in high school, I found flaws in my programs that would have been next to impossible to debug on a live server and found them years earlier 
when we still had plenty of time to fix them. Simple math that I learned in high school. Arithmetic sets, functions, and first order logic. Things that you uh, computer science students should be learning by the end of his first year in, uh, at the university. Uh, plus these two things, prime and box. Those are the only two things in the language that are not things you learned in your elementary math courses. And as you see, they're pretty simple. So a typical system specification, they're typically a little bit bigger than the two-phased handshake. Uh, the, uh, but they all have the same form, initial predicate, box, next state relation, subscript by the set of variables, and a liveness formula. The variables, they're typically maybe 10 variables, but they can have complicated var values. I mean, a variable may be uh, an array of records, of, of functions, of pairs, or something, fairly complicated. Uh, the initial predicate is typically just a dozen or so lines of, you know, very simple math. And the bulk of the specification is that next state relation. I mean, it was about, what, six lines for the two-phased handshake. It's about a thousand lines of, uh, in a typical uh, industrial spec. But it's still simple math and prime, you know, plus, you know, little arithmetic, some sets, uh, notations, and stuff like that. And the temporal logic, they're up to maybe about 15 lines of temporal formulas. Very often, uh, engineers don't even bother with the liveness because the, uh, they feel that the safety part is the place where there are most likely to be errors. They're most likely to build a clock that ticks the wrong number rather than a clock that stops. Uh, so this is where the action is. It's where the bulk of the specification, and it's simple math. Simple math that Dave Langworthy learned in high school uh, whether you learn it in high school or university depends on what country you're living in, but it's very basic stuff. It's not the rocket science that uh, uh, Mike spoke, spoke about. This is really simple math. And first sentence that I omitted before, what Dave wrote, and uh, and these, these quotes are things that Dave wrote uh, that, and other quotations are not pe ones that, you know, I didn't drag it out of them. These are things that they wrote in some context or, or other. He said, TLA plus taught me how to think. Chris Newcomb, a former Amazon engineer, is one of the authors of that paper in this communications of the ACM, said, TLA plus changed how I think. Brandon Batson, uh, who is my first informant at, uh, um, from Intel, said, the hard part of learning to write TLA plus specs is learning to think abstractly with experience engineers learn how to do it. And he also added, and that improves their system design. Learning to think abstractly. Well, it really isn't TLA plus that's teaching them that. Uh, computer scientists and engineers believe in this magical power of languages. You know, you just write the, get the right language and all the world's problems are going to be solved. And so when they see, you know, TLA plus, you know, doing some great things for them, they think it's, it's because it's a wonderful language. It's not TLA plus. You know, I didn't do anything that's terribly wonderful or brilliant in TLA plus. 
the brilliant thing that I did was to learn to use math. And what's really teaching them to think is thinking in math rather than programming languages. Programming languages don't teach you to think abstractly. Remember, we witnessed firsthand the brainwashing done by years of C programming. Programming languages are not thinking, teaching you to think abstractly. Now, not all languages are as brain damaging as C, and I don't mean to put down programming languages. Programming languages, you know, you know are complicated. They're complicated for a good reason. They've got a complicated job to, to, to solve. Uh, you write programs that are a lot more than a thousand lines. And your programs that you do write have to be executed efficiently. Mathematics doesn't get executed efficiently. It can get executed, in fact, by the, by the model checker, but, but not efficiently. And no language, no matter how wonderful the programming language designer you know, will think, you know, may tell you that they're great, wonderful, none are as simple and as expressive as elementary math. And uh, in, a, I can, in a very mathematical sense, elementary math is infinitely more expressive than any programming language. The fundamental problem facing computer engineers is complexity. And good engineer means making your systems as simple as possible. And the math needed to describe computer systems is simple. Programming languages are complicated. Again, complicated for good reasons. And I could you know, list a lot of ways in which they're you know, complicated, things like objects. Uh, when you look carefully at them, you know, they're really complicated. And if you think that programming, you know, some people have this notion that, you know, well, math is complicated. Programming languages are simple. Well, uh, the way people describe, explain programming languages is by giving them as semantics. They give the semantics of the programming language in mathematics. Nobody has ever tried giving the semantics to mathematics in terms of a programming language. You wouldn't get very far. You, programming languages are complicated, and you don't achieve simplicity by thinking in terms of complicated languages. Simplicity requires thinking abstractly before you start implementing. And this means thinking mathematically before you write any code. TLA Plus teaches you how to think mathematically because you're using mathematics to write your specification. Uh, few engineers are willing to try. They have years of brainwashing to overcome. And it began with their computer education, computer edu science education, that has somehow convinced them that programming language, that C is this wonderfully simple language, but that mathematics is this horribly complicated stuff. I mean, that's really backwards. Mathematical thinking needs to be taught at universities. Now, I think I know what students need to learn, and it's really fairly simple. Understanding a system as a state machine. If you look at the way I described, uh, like the two-phased handshake, initial predicate and next state relation, it's describing an abstract state machine. But describing the state machine, that students learn to describe the state machine mathematically in terms of an initial predicate and next state relation. Because if you look at all of the different ways of writing, automata, programming languages, Turing machines, whatever, they're all estate machines. Can be described very easily with initial predicate and next state relation. And thinking of implementation as substitution. 
because what you're doing, you know, if uh, you're implementing something, you know, as uh, a list, maybe as an array with pointers or something, what you're really doing is a substitution. Uh, exactly the same way that uh, the one bit of the uh, one bit clock was being implemented by those two bits of the handshake protocol. You're implementing simpler mathematical concepts like a list or a sequence with uh, more complicated objects, which are again can be described mathematically like arrays and pointers. So that's really all that, that you need to know to understand to start thinking mathematically about the systems you're building. But I'm not a teacher, so it's people here Many of you will be the next generation or are the current generations of teachers, and you have to be able to teach them that. Thank you.